Amlin Towns in Brunswick, by famous Hanover City, the river Weiser, deep and wide, washes its walls on either side. A pleasanter spot you never spied, but, when begins my ditty, almost five hundred years ago, to see the town folks suffer so, from vermin, was a pity. Rats. They fought the dogs and killed the cats, and bit the babies in the cradles, and ate the cheese out of the vats, and licked the soups from the cook's own ladles, split open the kegs of salted sprats, made nests inside men's Sunday hats, and even spoiled the woman's chats by drowning their speaking with shrieking and squeaking in fifty different sharps and flats. At last the people in a body to the town hall came flocking. Tis clear, they cried, our mayor's a naughty. As for our corporation, shocking, to think we buy gowns lined with ermine, for adults that can't or won't determine what's best to rid us of our vermin. You hope, because you're old and obese, to find in a furry civic robe ease. Rouse up, sirs, give your brains a racking, to find the remedy we're lacking, or, sure as fate, we'll send you packing. At this the mayor and corporation quacked with a mighty consternation. An hour they sat in council, at length the mayor broke silence. For a gilder I'd my ermine gown sell, I wish I wore a mile hence. It's easy to bid one's rack one's brain, I'm sure my poor head aches again, I've scratched it so, and all in vain. Oh, for a trap, a trap, a trap. Just as he said this, what should hap? At the chamber door but a gentle tap. Bless us, cried the mayor, what's that? With the corporation as he sat, looking little, though wondrous fat, nor brighter with his eye, nor moister, than a too long opened oyster. Save when at noon his paunch grew muttonous, for a plate of turtle, green and gluttonous. Only a scraping of shoes on the mat? Anything like the sound of a rat? Makes my heart go pit a pat. Come in, the mare cried, looking bigger, and in did come the strangest figure. His queer long coat from heel to head was half of yellow and half of red, and he himself was tall and thin, with sharp blue eyes, each like a pin, with light loose hair, yet swarthy skin, no tuft on cheek nor beard on chin, but lips where smiles went out and in. There was no guessing his kith or kin, and nobody could enough admire the tall man in his quaint attire. Quoth one, it's my great-grandsire. Starting up at the trump of doom's tone, he had walked his way from his painted tombstone. He advanced to the council table, and, please your honors, he said, I am able, by means of a secret charm, to draw all creatures living beneath the sun, that creep or swim or fly or run, after me so as you never saw. And I chiefly use my charm on creatures that do people harm. The mow and the toad and the newt and the viper. And people call me the Pied Piper. And here they noticed round his neck a scarf of red and yellow stripe to match with his coat of self-same check. And at the scarf's end hung a pipe. And his fingers they noticed were ever strain as if impatient to be plain. Upon this pipe, as low as it dangled, over his vesture so old-fangled. Yet, he said, Poor piper as I am, in Tartary I freed the cham, last June from his huge swarm of gnats, I eased in Asia the Nizam, of a monstrous brood of viper bats, and as for what your brain bewilders, if I can rid your town of rats, will you give me a thousand guilders? One, fifty thousand, was the exclamation of the astonished mayor and corporation. Into the street the piper stepped, smiling first a little smile as if he knew what magic slept in his quiet pipe the while. Then, like a musical adept, to blow the pipe his lips he wrinkled, and green and blue his sharp eyes twinkled, like a candle flame where salt is sprinkled. And ere three shrill notes the pipe uttered, you heard as if an army muttered, and the muttering grew into a grumble, and the grumbling grew into a mighty rumble, and out of the house the rats came tumbling, great rats, small rats, lean rats, brawny rats, Brown rats, black rats, gray rats, tawny rats, grave old plotters, gay young friskers, fathers, mothers, uncles, cousins, cocking tails and prickling whiskers, families by tens and dozens, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, followed the piper for their lives. From street to street he piped advancing, and step for step they followed dancing, until they came to the river Weiser, wherein all plunged and perished, save one who, stout as Julius Caesar, swam across and lived to carry, as he, the manuscript he cherished, 
to Ratlin home his commentary, which was, At the first shrill note of the pipe, I heard a sound of a scraping tripe, and putting apples wondrous ripe into cider press's grip, and a moving away of pickled tub boards, and a leaving a jar of conserve cupboards, and a drawing of the corks of a trained oil flask, and a breaking the hoops of buttered cask, and it seems as if a voice, sweeter far than by harp or by psaltery, is breathed, called out, O oh, rats, rejoice! The world is grown to one vast dysaltery. So munch on, crunch on, take your nuncheon, breakfast, supper, dinner, luncheon, and just as bulky, sugared puncheon, already staved, like a great sun shone, glorious scarce an inch before me. Just as me thought it said, Come, bore me, I found my visor rolling o'er me. You should have heard the Hamlin people, ringing the bells they rock the steeple. Go, cried the mayor, and get long poles, poke out the nests and block up the holes, consult with carpenters and builders, and leave in our town not even a trace of the rats, when suddenly, up the face, of the piper perked in a market-place, with a, first, if you please, my thousand guilders. A thousand guilders, the mayor looked blue, so did the corporation, too, for council dinners were rare habit, with clarinet, mussel, vindigrave, hawk, the half the money would replenish their seller's biggest butt with rhenish, to pay this sum to a wandering fellow, with a gypsy coat of red and yellow. Beside, quoth the mayor, with a knowing wink, our business was done at the river's brink. We saw with our eyes the vermin sink, and what's dead can't come to life, I think. So, friend, we're not the folks to shrink from the duty of giving you something for drink, and a matter of money to put in your poke. But as for the guilders, what we spoke of them, as you very well know, was a joke. Besides, our losses have made us thrifty. A thousand guilders? Come, take fifty. The piper's face fell, and he cried, No trifling, I can't wait. Beside, I've promised to visit by dinner time, Baghdad, and accept the prime of a head cook's pottage, all he's rich in, for having left, in the Calfat's kitchen, of a nest of scorpions, no survivor, with him I prove no bargain driver, with you, don't think I'll bait a striver, and folks who put me in a passion may find me pipe after a different fashion. How, cried the mayor, do you think I brook, being worse treated than a cook, insulted by a lazy ribald, with idle pipe and vesture piebald? You threaten us, fellow, do your worst, blow your pipe till you burst. Once more he stepped into the street, and to his lips again laid his long pipe a smooth straight cane, and ere he blew three notes, such sweet, soft notes as any musician's cunning, never gave the enraptured air. There was a rustling that seemed like a bustling, of merry crowds justling at pitching and hustling. Small feet were pattering, wooden shoes clattering, little hands clapping and little tongues chattering. And, like fowls in a farmyard, when barley is scattering, out came the children running, all the little boys and girls, with rosy cheeks and flaxen curls, and sparkling eyes and teeth like pearls, tripping and skipping, ran merrily after, the wonderful music was shouting and laughter. The mare was dumb, and the council stood, as if they were changed to blocks of wood, unable to move a step or cry, to the children's merrily skipping by, could only follow with the eye, that joyous crowd at the piper's back, by how the mare was on the rack, and the wretched council bosoms beat, as a piper turned from the high street, to where the visor rolled its waters, right to the way of their sons and daughters. However, he turned from south to west, and Coppelberg Hill his steps addressed, and after him the children pressed, great was a joy in every breast. He never can cross that mighty top, he's forced to let the piping drop, and we shall see our children stop. When lo, as they reached the mountain side, a wondrous portal opened wide, as if a cavern were suddenly hollowed, and the piper advanced, and the children followed. And all were in, to the very last, the door in the mountain's side shut fast. Did I say all? No. One was lame, and could not dance the whole of the way, and in after years, if you would blame, his sadness, he was used to say, It's dull in our town since my playmates left. I can't forget that I'm bereft of all the pleasant sights they see, which the piper also promised me. For he led us, he said, to a joyous land, Joining the town, and just at hand, where waters gushed and fruit trees grew, and flowers put forth a fairer hue, and everything was strange and new, the sparrows were brighter than peacocks here, 
and their dogs outran our fallow deer, and honeybees had lost their stings, and horses were born with eagles' wings, and just as I became assured my lame foot would be speedily cured, the music stopped, and I stood still, and found myself outside the hill, left alone against my will, to go now limping as before, and never hear of that country more. Alas, alas for Hamlin, there came into many a burgher's pate a text which says that heaven's gate opt to the rich at as easy a rate as the needle's eye takes a camel in. The mare sent east, west, north, and south to offer the piper by word of mouth whatever it was men's lot to find him, silver and gold to his heart's content if it only returned the way he went and bring the children behind him. But when they saw twas a lost endeavor, the piper and dancers were gone forever. They made a decree that lawyers never should think their records dated duly, if, after the day of the month and year, these words did not as well appear. And so long after what happened here, on 22nd of July, 1376, and the better in memory to fix the place of the children's last retreat, they call it the Pied Piper Street where anyone playing on a pipe or tabor was sure for the future to lose his labor, nor suffered they hostelry or tavern to shock with mirth a street so solemn, but opposite the place of a cavern they wrote the story on a column. And on the great church window painted the same to make the world acquainted how their children were stolen away, and there it stands this very day. And I must not omit to say that in Transylvania there's a tribe of alien people who ascribe the outlandish ways and dress of which their neighbors lay such stress to their fathers and mothers have arisen out of some subterraneous prison into which they were trepanned long time ago in a mighty band out of Hamlin town and Brunswick land but how or why they don't understand so Willie let me and you be wipers of scores out with all men especially pipers and whether they pipe us free from rats or from mice if we've promised them aught, let us keep our promise.